as we have heard the last few weeks, are lifelines. Every emotion we could ever go through in life is found in the Psalms. Whether we're weeping and in deep sorrow, we turn to Psalm 6, as Pastor preached last week. Or we have horrible anxieties of sleeping at night and trouble going to bed. We turn to Psalm 4, where verse 8 tells us, I will lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Or you feel that you have went to a pit of despair and you have no hope, and you turn to Psalm 42, and you're comforted from the word of the Lord. Or you're crushed over your sin, and you need to run to the Lord in repentance, but you don't know what words to say, so you turn to Psalm 51 or Psalm 25, and hear the psalmist put words to your emotions. The list goes on and on and on and on of how the psalms speak to us and give us these words. And unfortunately and sadly in today's day and age, we spend a lot of our time in struggle. We battle depression. We battle anxieties. We struggle with being worried constantly or feeling downcast or broken. However, there must be times in our lives where we're in praise and worship and joy to the Lord. And that is where he brings us this morning to Psalm 98. This is a psalm of praise. We gather here each and every week to sing praises to the Lord. Praises of his faithfulness. Praises of his mercies that are new every morning. Praises of his long suffering, his holiness, his sovereignty, his peace. And praises for his glorious gospel which he so graciously gives us. And this is how Psalm 98 takes us. May we go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we can gather together and worship you. We thank you for your word, O oh God. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Lord, you know the heart of each individual here. You know their condition before you, O oh God. You know their past. You know their future. You know their current situations. You know their struggles, you know their emotions, you know their thoughts. So Lord, I pray that you would feed each person here in accordance to their needs from your word, O oh God. That your words would be spoken through me this morning, O oh Spirit of God. That for those who are feeling downcast and broken, that they may be comforted and lifted up. To those who are far from you, God, and do not know you, may you convict them this morning, Spirit of God, that they may run to you. And for those who hearts are full, God, may they burst forth in joyous praise unto you this morning, O God. Feed us today, Christ our King. Feed your sheep this morning. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. It's in your name we pray, King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Psalm 98 starts off with, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. We are called to sing. We are called to sing to the Lord and shout of his praises. This is found many places throughout the scriptures. A few listed on the screen. Psalm 95, O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Psalm 96, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Psalm 100, make a joyful shout unto the Lord all the lands. Psalm 101, I will sing mercy and justice to you, O Lord. I will sing praises. Ephesians 5, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are called to sing, specifically here, sing a new song. We're called to sing a new song that reflects the new heart, the new creation, the new life in Christ Jesus. Those who have been born again will sing a new song than before. They change their wonder, they change their joy, and they change their notes. Since God has put a new heart in our chest, 
He will put a new song in our mouths. A picture of this is found in Ezekiel 36, where God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take out the heart of stone of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and I, you will keep my judgments and do them. The new heart in our chest will burst forth new songs out of our mouth. May I also add here that if you come here each week as we sing praises and you are not singing, that you need to seek the Lord in prayer and get your heart right with him. The joy we have will overflow from our mouths with song. If you think back in your life in the times where your heart's full of joy, maybe it takes you back to a memory of your childhood, or maybe when your kids were born, or the day you were saved, or the day you were baptized, or a time in your life where your heart was full of joy, there's a song that will burst forth from you. It bothers me as a pastor, as a believer, as a Christian, when we come here to worship to see people not sing. Has Christ not changed your life? Has he not delivered you from death itself? If we're too timid to worry about what the person beside us is going to think of us by our singing voice, then how will we ever be bold enough to share the gospel with an unbeliever? Amen. You know when you're riding in the car and that song hits you at the right time, with the right words, with the right thing that you're going through that day, and either A, you burst into tears, or B, you're angry that day and that song feeds that emotion and you turn it up till the point where you're about to bust out the windows in the car, or it's exactly what you're going through, so you start belting the lyrics to that song at the top of your lungs. Music is given to put emotions to words. That is why the Psalms exist. They are songs given for our emotions. If we can sing secular lyrics in the car or in the shower with no shame because they're exactly how we're feeling, how much more should we sing praises during worship to God? Amen. Men, are you leading your family in joyful singing unto the Lord? Now, I know men typically don't like to sing. Well, get over it. We're commanded to. Does your family hear you sing? Do they see and hear your joy in the Lord? Moms, do your kids see your joy and hear you sing of the praises of the Lord? Or do they see the other side of you the majority of the time? Where you're having a bad day, or you're frustrated, or you're aggravated, they won't get their shoes on, or we're running late, or whatever the case may be. Do they hear of the joy of the Lord? Do your kids sing? For those of you who have children, do your kids sing or do they keep quiet, keep to themselves, stay in their phones and their tablets or on their video games? Students in the room, do you sing unto the Lord or are you just here because mommy and daddy make you come? If you have spent any time around me, you'll learn two things or you'll know two things about me and songs. One, I will burst forth into song at any given time. And two, as my children can testify, I cannot sing worth a lick. <laughs> it drives my kids crazy. It drives the kids of the youth group crazy when there's three of us and I'm like, hey guys, you know what? We're still singing tonight. However, however, they know where my joy comes from. They hear it belt out to me. It can't be contained. And then that goes forward and I hear my kids start to sing and worship, whether we're driving down the road and I refuse to listen to secular music when my kids are in the car. And my kids learn these songs and my kids start belting out, oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, worship his holy name. And then sometimes you just sit back in worship service and you just look and your heart's full of joy to see young people singing praises unto the Lord. Since the song of Moses in Genesis 15 God's people have been singing praises unto him. And we're called to be a congregation of people. We're called as God's people to sing praises unto him. 
So since his mercies are new every morning, sing a new song. Since he is giving you a new heart, sing a new song. Since he is giving you new desires, sing a new song. Since he is giving you new life, sing a new song. Why? Verse 1 continues. For he has done marvelous things. The protection of God's chosen people during the plagues. The sending down of fire down on Mount Carmel to Elijah. The great Philistine being killed by a young man with a pebble. Manna being sent from heaven to feed God's people. Jonah and the great fish. Daniel and the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being saved from the fiery furnace. The list goes on and on of the marvelous things the Lord has done. Not to mention Christ himself. For Christ was born in a marvelous way. He stepped out of heaven, took the form of a man, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin. He lived a marvelous life, right? He was tempted in all ways, as Hebrews tells us, yet completely sinless. He was fully God, yet fully man. People marveled at his teachings and his works. For Christ made the blind to see and the deaf to hear and the lame to walk. And he brought the dead to life. Right? He made the outcast of society feel welcome and the religious leaders angry. People marveled at these things of Christ. They marveled at his death. The sky went dark. The earth shook. Right? The veil was rent in two. He ascended marvelously into heaven. He has sent forth his Holy Spirit in a marvelous way. The apostles, by the work of the Holy Spirit, have marveled the world by the works done through them. It's a marvelous thing that the Lord has done. He continues. He says, His right hand and his holy arm have gained him victory. This is not done with the help or the aid of others. This is not accomplished with the need of assistance. Think on these things. Did the Lord really need the help of Moses and his staff to part the Red Sea? Did God really need the people marching around the walls to drop the walls of Jericho? The battles of Ai, Assyria, and the Philistines were all won by the Lord. The victory has been won by his own power and his own work. Man's idols and errors have all been beaten and put to death by Christ. He has been victorious over sin, over death, and over hell. Christ has, won the phys- Christ has won the battle, not by his physical might, but by his holy moral power. Christ's obedience to the law of God is something no one else could accomplish, something only Christ could do. You see, brothers and sisters, Christ has been brought to life, but so have others. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Jairus' daughter, Paul, brought someone back to life after they fell asleep and fell out of a window. EMTs bring people back to life. Others have been crucified as there were two criminals next to Jesus on the cross that day. Others have even claimed to be God. But only Christ was spotless and sinless. Christ has won the battle by himself and for himself, but also for us. Paul comments on these things in Romans 8 and says, Yet in all these things, in the things of Christ, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Christ has brought us salvation by his own works. He has not done this with the help of our works, not by the physical baptism of our bodies, not by some words we've spoken or some prayer we've prayed, but by his own obedience and sacrifice. We battle sin and we conquer it by giving it to the Lord. We have struggles in life, and we make it through them by giving them to the Lord. Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast your cares and burdens on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Think on some battles in your own life that the Lord has won. Has the Spirit killed a sin that you once struggled with profusely? Has God restored a broken relationship to a friend or a family member or a loved one? Has he brought you out of a pit of brokenness and despair or depression or struggle? 
as he provided for you in times where it seemed that there was no hope. Isaiah 59, 16 says, He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm has brought salvation for him and his own righteousness, it sustained him. Salvation is a gift from God, bought, paid for, and accomplished by the holy blood of Christ the Lamb. He, is, he alone has made intercession on our behalf. He alone fulfilled the law. He alone sufficed the wrath of God against the sin of the world. He alone is where our is found. He alone has won the victory. The psalmist continues in verse 2. He said, The Lord has made known his salvation. By the coming of our Lord and Savior and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit shown at Pentecost, the Lord has made known his salvation. Salvation would not have been sought after, much less found by man if the Lord had not made it known to us. God has revealed his Son and given us his Spirit, therefore he has made his salvation known. Without his Spirit, we never see Christ at all. We never understand our sin before him or the gospel. For gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Without the Lord making his salvation known to us, we would not seek after him or his righteousness. We're told in Romans chapter 3, which quotes Psalm 14 and quotes Psalm 53. Paul says, as it is written, meaning as it's been recorded previously, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. This is the special revelation of God. And without God making his salvation known to us, we can never, ever understand it. Even more of a reason for us to sing a new song. He continues in verse 2. He says, his righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. The acts of the Lord were so amazing that the world marveled at them, and God thus reveals his attributes to the nations. Whether it be from the mercy of God to not kill Adam and Eve on that day. For what were Adam and Eve told? For the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. For the mercy of God not killing them that day, or the faithfulness of the Lord to deliver his people from Egyptian captivity, or the love of God shown through his gospel, the Lord's righteousness has been shown to the nations. Paul tells us that righteousness from God has been revealed to his people. Whether those people be Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, white, black, brown, purple, gold, orange, doesn't matter, the Lord has shown righteousness to his people. Paul tells, tells us these things in Romans 1. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for, in it the, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. This is where God gives his righteousness to his people is found in the gospel. Amen. Verse 3. He says, he has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. We should sing a new song and praises to the Lord because he has not forgotten his promises of old. He has not forgotten his promises to his chosen nation. He remembered the promise he made to Abraham and to his seed. God has just not brought these to memory, but to action. To the Jews, Christ came in the flesh and the gospel was preached to them first. Through them has come the Messiah, and God has shown mercy and faithfulness to them by fulfilling his promises. Look with me at a few verses speaking of the birth of the Messiah, the birth of Christ. As I studied on this text, I could not help but think, as agreed with some of the commentaries I read, that this psalm was on the heart of Mary and Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, when speaking of the birth of Christ. In the song of Mary recorded for us by Luke, she says, He, God, has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, 
to Abraham and to his seed forever. He has remembered his house of Israel. And Zacharias, who spoke, who prophesied of this, he said, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has redeemed and visited his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation in the house of his servant David. He has spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform mercy promised to our fathers and the remembrance of his holy covenant. God has remembered his nation Israel. He has not forgotten the promises he made to them. He led them out of captivity. He won the battles. Read the Old Testament. He won the battles over and over and over and over. He loved them. He redeemed them. He gave them the Messiah. He has fulfilled his covenants. It continues and said, And not only has he remembered his faithfulness to the house of Israel, but all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Not to Abraham's seed alone according to the flesh, but to the elect among all nations, grace has been given. Foretold of 700 years before Christ by the prophet Isaiah, as well as found in other Psalms and proved and referenced in the New Testament. Look at some of these verses. Isaiah says, The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. He says to his servant, I will give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Psalm 22, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. Acts 13, for the Lord has commanded us, I will set you as a light to the Gentiles that salvation for to the ends of the earth. All the nations have seen the salvation of the Lord. Christ came and the good news of him spread from Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. The deliverance of God's people from sin, death, and hell has not only been shown and given to Israel, but to the nations. The book of Revelation tells us, and they sang a new song. For you, Christ, are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. A people of every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. When we worship God one day around the throne, we will be joined in saints from all different backgrounds, all different regions, all different people groups, all different tongues. Meaning, Sunday should not be the most segregated day of the week. It should be the opposite of that. Our church should be a picture of that. We should have a very diverse group of people united completely by the work of the gospel and a worship to God for it. To paraphrase one author here, he says, the words have seen in this verse imply actual faith, united with knowledge that moves the will to love and desire. For these people cannot be said to have seen God's salvation if they never bestow a thought on a Savior. The gospel is open to all who would call upon the name of the Lord. From those who worshiped in the temple in Jerusalem to those who previously worshiped foreign idols and foreign gods. From those who sit in church service each week to those who roam the streets. From the people who are culturally ingrained in the Bible from the time they are born to the most remote tribe in the middle of the, in the, middle of the wilderness, salvation is open to all who would call upon Christ. He continues, the psalmist, and says, shout joyfully to the Lord. He says, shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth, break forth in song, rejoice and sing praises. Here the psalmist repeats himself from verse 1, except now is addressing the nations at large. He indicates that when God breaks down the walls of separation, all would be gathered into one common faith and one church would be formed throughout the world. This is the church of those who have been redeemed by Christ. Every tongue must applaud and every heart will rejoice. Loud songs of praises, hosannas, and hallelujahs will be proclaimed from the mountaintops and the rooftops. 
The great John Wesley has said here to his people, he says, sing lustily and with good courage. Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep. But lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, no more ashamed of it being heard than when you once sung the songs of Satan. Let every form of praise be used and every music be put into worship until the skies reflect the joyful noise given unto our Lord. The great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon said here, he said, there is no fear of being too hearty and magnifying the God of our salvation. Only we must take care that our song comes from the heart. Otherwise, if it does not come from the heart, the music is nothing but noise to his ears, whether it be caused by human throats or organ pipes or far-resounding trumpets. Let our hearts ring out the honors of the conquering Savior. With all of our might, let us extol the Lord who vanquished our enemies and led our captivity captive. He will do this the best who is most in love with Christ. The psalmist continues. He says, sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and with the sound of a psalm. God's praises should be performed in the best way possible. But the beauty of God's praises lie in the heart behind them. Praises that bring the most joy to the Lord are repentance and faith, love and compassion, obedience and a broken and contrite heart. Praises brought to the Lord in the right way are far greater in his eyes than the greatest performance by the most skilled musicians and singers who perform in vain or for themselves or for their audience or for the praise they get. Psalm 51 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. The repetition of this word is more poetic here found in verse 5. With the harp, with the harp. Showing the fragile expressions of poetry are not too rich to praise the Lord. The worship of God should be plain. It should be simple. It should be concise and to the point, yet it should be refined. The Most High will accept the simple, joyous song of the farmer or the factory worker, but he'll also welcome the most elaborate presentation by the greatest pianist on the earth as long as it is given to God with a heart of worship. Other places in Scripture, we are warned of vain repetitions. Jesus said, do not pray this way, right? Yet all praise, excuse me, yet not all repetitions are done in vain. We should repeat the faithfulness and graces of our Lord. If our heart is in the right place, and it reminds us of the goodness of God, then sing that new song on repeat. And may the praise song of Christ be stuck in our heads for all of eternity. The, to sing with the song, excuse me, to sing with the sound of a psalm is to be vocal with our music to the Lord. Albert Barnes has said here, he said, this is singing, a musical voice. Let it not be mere instrumental music, but let that be accompanied with the voice uttering intelligible sounds or words. The only proper use of instrumental mental music, in the worship of God is to deepen the impression which the words are adapted to make, to secure a better influence of the truth of the heart, meaning sing unto the Lord. He continues, he says, with trumpets and with the sound of the horn, shout joyfully before the Lord the King. The trumpet was used, as we're told in the book of Numbers, for gathering a public assembly for worship or assembling the army for battle. The shout of the trumpet and the sound of a horn bring with it power, mainly the heartily power of praise. For ages and ages and ages, when a king is crowned or a leader is brought through the city, shouts of praises and trumpets will be sounded for the king or the leader. Should people be more eager and excited for earthly rulers... Oh, the divine king of kings. So president, so Trump is the president and the ruler of the United States. Well, Christ is king and Lord over all the earth. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords and there is none like him. Our praises should be so much different 
than any other since Christ is like no other. So quote the artist Shailen, he says, after all that, Donald Trump's the president. It's all good, though, because Jesus trumps the president. Amen. Did you jump for joy when your candidate was elected? Did you post about it all over the Internet? Did you maybe defend them when someone was arguing against them? Did you text or call your friends to express joy over it? Maybe it brought you a sigh of relief that someone else was not elected. Well, brothers and sisters, Christ is king and that should cause our hearts to explode with joy. We should post it all over the internet. We should call our families and friends and tell them all about it. We should defend him when others come against him. It should overwhelm our souls with deep happiness and true joy. So shout joyfully before the Lord, for he is the king. Amen. The psalmist continues in verses 7 and 8. He says, let the sea roar. In all of its fullness. Excuse me, the world and all those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful before the Lord together. Let the sea roar. This is not a roar of terror. This is a roar of praise. The same seas that God once used in the days of Noah to bring judgment on the entire earth, minus eight people, will burst forth and praise to the Lord. The waters once used to bring destruction will now join the people of this world and rejoice in Christ our King. All of creation will sing praise unto the Lord. He alone is worthy. He is the creator and the sustainer. The rest of the creation will join with the people of God and shout of Jehovah's faithfulness and greatness. The seas that were once ceased by the command of Christ the King will burst forth with praise at his rule and his reign. Even the creatures of the deep will praise the king. If the great fish that swallowed Jonah is still alive, he will sing praises of the king. The creation as a whole is called to praise the Lord. Everything that has been created by God is ordered to worship him. Psalm 19 says the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims his handiwork. The purpose of the sky is to magnify and worship the Lord. Luke 19, as seen on the screen behind me. Jesus answered the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees are, at this point, they're rebuking Jesus. They're telling Jesus that you need to tell your disciples to stop. The disciples at this point are shouting praises to praise for the King of Kings, Praise for the Lord. They're shouting hosannas of Christ and his reign. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are rebuking Jesus, telling him that they need to be quiet. And Jesus responds and says to the Pharisees, I tell you, if these people who are shouting these worships to me shall be quiet, that the very stones would immediately cry out. If we were to not sing praises unto the Lord, creation itself would break forth in worship. The rivers of God are told to join men and clap their hands in praise. The hills are told to join God's people in singing praises that are due to him. The mountains and the plains, the rural and the urban, the prisoner and the soldier, the desert and the rivers, young and old, all will join and worship the Lord. May this encourage our souls to never cease singing praises unto the Lord. His creation is called to worship him. And since we are a part of that creation, may the song of praise ever be on our hearts. For not only has Christ created us, he has kept us, he has blessed us, he has redeemed us by his own blood. He ends, the psalmist does, in verse 9. He says, For he is coming to judge the earth with righteousness, he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. Every year at Christmas, we celebrate Advent, which is the coming, the coming of Christ, right? And here we praise for not only his first coming, but his second. The first coming of Christ brought salvation to those who would call on him. It brought peace, for he is the Prince of Peace. It brought pardon. It brought righteousness imputed to us and has given us eternal life. The second coming, Christ is coming to judge 
And that will either, depending on where your heart is with him, bring praise or terror. John Gill has said here, he said, The inhabitants of the earth, small and great, high and low, rich and poor, slave and free, alive and dead, righteous and wicked, when all works, words, and thoughts, good or bad, will be brought to account, and every man will be judged, as those shall be, with or without the grace of God. Christ is coming to judge the earth. Each man will be judged in accordance to their deeds. And the perfect judge will judge rightly. He will not be bribed. He will not be swayed by flowery allurements. He will judge rightly and justly. No corruption, failure, or error is even possible with his judgment. And each man or woman will have to give an account of what they have done. All men shall be judged with an equal and just judgment. No nation or people group shall be favored or suffer through prejudice. The slave shall be tried the same as his owner. The boss the same as the employee who has worked for him. The rich and the poor. The Pharisee and the outcast. The church member and those who live in open rebellion to God. The sinner and the saint, saint shall all be judged with the same judgment. So I ask you today, how will you hold up on that day of judgment? The God who knows your every thought, who knows every second of your entire life, who has for not forgotten your actions nor you since the day you were born, will judge you based on what you have done. So I ask you, how will you plead on that day? How will you plead? I urge you to plead guilty now, because on that day it will be too late. On that day, Christ will not be swayed by any plea you may have for him. Think about it. If you're in a court system and you've done a serious crime and the judge is there and you said, hey, you've, set, you, you've broken the law, you must pay the penalty. And you plead your case before that judge. And you say, but I've done good things. I volunteer at my church. You know, I help little old ladies across the street. I volunteer at the community youth center. I do all these things. The judge is going to say, I, I don't care. But judge, I give, I give half of my income to, to the church or I give half my income to the Salvation Army or the Red Cross. And the judge is going to say, I, I, I don't care. I'm judging you based on what you have done. And you have broken the law. But judge, I'm really sorry for what I've done. Well, good, you should be. Now you must suffer the consequences of your actions. The only thing will matter on the day that Christ judges us is are you righteous? Has your debt been paid? Is the Lord your salvation from sin and death? As I close, may we burst forth in joy and in song. Since the whole earth and all that are clothed in it are done so with God's hand, should we not be joyous? The Lord has made known his salvation to us. He will come again and he will judge rightly and he will set all things right. May we always sing a new song of Christ, of his reign, of his salvation, of his judgment. Oh, may we sing a new song to the Lord. For, Lord, you have done marvelous things. Your right hand and your holy arm have gained you the victory. You have made known your salvation. Your righteousness you have revealed in the sight of the nations. You have remembered your mercy and your faithfulness to the house of the Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation you give. So may we shout joyfully to you, all the earth break forth in song and rejoice and sing praises. May we sing to you with the harp, with the harp and the sound of a psalm. With the trumpets and the sound of a horn, we shout joyfully before you, the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar in all its fullness, the world and all those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before you, O God. For you are coming to judge the earth. With righteousness you shall judge the world and the peoples 